speaking to the uh, March 6 uh, budget workshop. Uh, I'll briefly go over the agenda and the format, and then we'll jump uh, right into it. We're going to cover uh, staffing and benefits. Uh, the superintendent will discuss staffing changes at our district-wide uh, positions. Uh, then Pauline will review uh, some of the major drivers of benefits. Uh, then we'll review um, instructional support and then Pond Cove, the middle school and high school. And at the end of that, uh, our hope is we can uh, address uh, the majority of the questions that were submitted um, to us. And uh, hopefully we'll address those questions. So at the end of the presentations, we'll have a question and answer. And um, with, uh, that's the plan. And um, we'll go ahead and start with uh, the superintendent on uh, staffing at the uh, K through 12 level. Um, so, from the broadest perspective, the budget includes um, increases for the negotiated um, collective bargaining agreement. So, um, right now, that's a 2% increase for teachers, as was negotiated last year. Um, our other bargaining units are still in the works, um, so we don't have. Um, increases, known increases for those groups yet, but um, just for budget purposes, we did put in placeholders. Um, as we look at staffing district-wide, there really are no district-wide programmatic changes, um, with the exception of the addition of a K-12 literacy coordinator position. Um, we had a literacy coordinator position at the high school. The person in that position made a decision um, to return to their prior um, instructional position, a teaching position at the high school. Um, and as we looked at the district goals, with being literacy um, and professional learning communities, the need for ongoing professional development in literacy was um, very evident. I would say that as we have talked as an administrative team and as uh, we have worked with a K-6 literacy task force and this year a 7 through 12 um, literacy task force, the professional development needs are very clear. Um, in addition, we have curriculum needs moving forward as we um, catch up to Common Core um, requirements and changes that are occurring there. So we looked at a way to address those needs K-12. So the position, um, is basically funded by the teacher who was at the high school returning to her position, so that position is vacant. And then by a shift of um, roughly $20,000 that was allocated for district-wide professional development, which in the past has been used for um, literacy consultants. Um, I, we see the position, and there's a job description included in the job description section. Um, we see the position as being a year-round position because much of the professional development that occurs for teachers takes place during the summer. Um, we see that person um, also taking on curriculum coordination responsibilities in language arts and to support the inclusion of best practices and literacy instruction into content areas um, at the secondary level. Um, the job description sort of lays out what kinds of qualifications we're looking for. Clearly, this is someone who is a literacy expert. Um, and I think it will serve our district needs well. Um, the job goal, which I'll read just because I think it makes it about as clear as you can, um, is to provide continuous job-embedded professional development, supporting teachers in all content areas in their instruction in reading, writing, listening, viewing, and speaking, to coordinate district-wide curriculum work in English language arts, and to support the implementation of the Common Core Standards. about that position that I um, this I do have. That okay? I'm sure. Um, so this is a position that reports directly to you, correct? That is correct. And will this be per where um, physically will this person's office be? I, I, we haven't even broached that subject uh, really. They would be school based or they would be central office based uh, or um, I mean, uh, you know, I think there are people around this table who could <laughs> speak differently to that. Jane has an office in the superintendent's office but spends the majority of her time in schools. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly spend a percentage of my time in schools. I expect that this person's position will be largely spent in schools. Um, whether or not they'll be physically housed in schools is going to come down to what spaces are available that are best conducive to this person doing their work. Curriculum 
coordination will um, only include um, language arts. Specifically, the person is responsible for English language arts K-12, but as we look at the common core standards, there are literacy and communication standards embedded in the content area standards in science and in history, for example. Um, so I expect that that person will be working with those curriculum committees to make sure that their curriculum reflects those requirements. Actually, do you have a question? Why you all looking at me? Ask. Um, I was wondering um, here on the evaluation section, it does say that the um, performance of this job will be evaluated in accordance with the provisions of the board's policy and/or board action on evaluation of professional personnel. I I'm wondering, can you flush that out for me and, and sort of explain what evaluation? I think all of our job descriptions have that same statement. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, there are policies requiring supervision and evaluation, so each of our employees is evaluated annually. Um, you know, in writing, there are performance criteria lined out in this person's job responsibilities, so it would be a reflection on whether or not they're meeting those responsibilities. So, more specifically, how, what metrics will we be using to discover or learn of the effectiveness of having the K-12 literacy coordinator? So, in part, that person's going to be receiving feedback on professional development activities that are led. I mean, if you're looking for the direct correlation, immediate correlation to student performance, you're not going to see one. You know, at any time you're doing a, a, a new thing, mm -hmm. it takes several years to realize the benefits of that, and, and frankly, we've, we've begun some of that work already. Um, but what that person, uh, you know, if, if you lead a professional development activity in this role, then the expectation is that you're going to be getting feedback about how effective that professional development was for teachers. Mm -hmm. um, if you're modeling a lesson in a classroom, the expectation is that teachers are going to be giving you feedback about how effective that was, mm -hmm. that there'll be conversations about that. I fully expect that administrators are going to be in conversations and reflecting on their observations of this person's performance and um, interactions with teachers and their impact on the school. Um, so it's, as it is with a teaching position, it's observational, um, okay. you know, and it, and it is um, really looking very carefully at their work um, and how well they're meeting the professional responsibilities. Um, in addition, anytime you're working with someone, you're setting goals for that individual. So that individual is going to help identify some goals for his or her performance as well. That may be in addition to the job responsibilities. Uh, I know you're asking me for an exact checklist. No. And I, I can't give you one. No, I wasn't. Okay. I was just wondering <laughs> what metrics will be used to evaluate the person's effectiveness in our yeah. system. And, and that gives me a good idea. Okay. David, did you have a question? Uh, a couple. I just want to make sure I understand because literacy tends to mean reading. This person's going to be reading and writing. Abs and verbal communication. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, uh, uh, for the audience, I want to emphasize this Please. is the uh, K through 12 position, which That's means right. we're going to try to vertically integrate our entire literacy slash writing program from kindergarten through 12th grade. And this is one of our probably one of our first, if not only, position that does that. Can I say something, Pauline? Mm -hmm. oh. is, is that correct? Um, uh, there, are, there are only a couple of us who work K-12 right now. Um, Jane is one of them, Pauline is one, and, and I guess I'm the other. Um, it, you know, there are a couple of exceptions with, uh, you know, uh, psychology. I was thinking more example. in terms of curriculum, you know, teaching. Yes, as that opposed. is true. Since the curriculum coordinator position was um, removed from the budget a few years ago, this is the, this is the most recent position. Um, <coughs> lastly, uh, since you, um, I don't know if you have more on staffing, but I have questions about staffing, but they may be more directed to when we get to instructional support or Pond Cove or middle school. I assume I should leave those questions. Correct. Uh, the superintendent is going to go through uh, K through 12 district-wide positions and polling. is going to review uh, district-wide benefits. And then the uh, principals of the three schools and instructional support uh, director will review staffing changes uh, at, at their schools or departments. Okay. Thank you. 
Colleen, so. do you want to speak to benefits? Sure. Benefits. But, um, our total salary and benefit increase for next year, when you compare that to what we have budgeted for this year, is a total of 2.4%. 1.9% is salary increases, and 4.4% is our benefit increase uh, for the total uh, K-12 budget. Um, a, the, um, what I want to say is the 11-12 budget, which is our current year, um, we have over 300 employees. Last year we had over 30 staff changes. New employees came in, uh, employees left. Um, so we had many staff changes that required changes in our benefits or the selection of uh, benefits. So when you compare next, our proposed budget for next year, you're comparing it to current year but with many changes uh, for next year and that's why you see the percentages in some accounts are higher some are lower we have current employees who make changes in their uh, insurance selection um, so we're always uh, changing those uh, those benefits so when we when I budgeted for next year we look at actually who we have on board currently what their selection is for insurance, and that's what we budget. So it may not compare to that same total benefit selection the previous year. So that's why you see a lot of changes and increases and decreases. Someone may have, for example, gone from no insurance at all to picking up a family plan. So that would bring the, ins the percentage much higher than what um, we expect if someone has the same coverage. The big driver, of course, for our uh, benefits are our proposed 10% um, increase in health insurance. Um, so does anyone have any questions? I was just going to say add? related to the 10% increase, that's your placeholder because we don't yet have the actual number. Correct. That's a proposed percentage increase, and we hopefully will have those numbers by mid to late April. I just want to expand a bit because it's a little bit misleading, and I, I think I, I just want to expand on what you said because I think we're trying to explain that a 4.4% yeah. increase in benefits is probably, is, is, is not a true number that each person got a 4.4 percent. No. Some people may have opted out of insurance and therefore it's zero. Some people, you've counted every single person and then averaged over the benefit increase because insurance alone last year increased 6.1 percent and we're projecting 10 percent. So this is averaging over everybody. Right. We had 30, 30 staff changes. So people leaving and people coming in uh, makes a big difference. A more accurate average may be the salary. Since everybody does get a salary, the roughly 2% increase in salary is probably a more accurate average than the benefits then. Correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe for uh, some of the board members' uh, benefit, uh, on some of the line items, uh, you know, maybe you could just discuss while the, the percentage change for a certain school may be greater than the 1.9 percent due to some of the federal jobs uh, money, how it's accounted for. Right. We did receive some federal uh, jobs funding for 11-12 this current year. Um, in the comparison in the salaries and benefits, I, um, I added those funds in 11-12 to make a better comparison. Um, what, most what of that. What page is that? What chart are you looking at? This is in the salaries and benefits uh, printout page. It starts on page three under salaries and benefits. If you see at the top, I have I said federal funds added to FY 11-12 for comparison. So we have $452,000 in those 
uh, numbers in 1112 spread throughout uh, the budget, which are federal funds. Michael, was your question, do you see similar discrepancies? One building may be up 3% in salaries and another might be up 1.5%. Is your is The answer to that question, is it similar to the benefits issue? It's due to the changes in individual people filling those jobs. So if a new employee is hired at a lesser salary, for example, than someone who retired or left the district, then you would see a, a change. And vice versa, if someone enters the district who is receiving a higher salary is at a different place on the salary scale than their predecessor, then you might see a greater number. And probably maybe for the, uh, well, the, uh, the CPI impact, I know for the teacher's contract it was uh, 0.5 to 2 percent uh, capped at uh, CPI urban workers, I believe. TPIU. Yes, right. TPIU. And, and uh, we're it was capped at 2%, and uh, the CPI was higher than that. Um, it was, I believe, 3.9%. Uh, so we um, budgeted a 2% increase on the base. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Pauline on the overall salary and benefits as a, on a district-wide basis? Pauline, there's nothing we can do about this. This is something that's part of our budget and there's no control. It's um, just part of our budget. Of what? Um, the increases that uh, particular uh, staffing people take um, to take care of their families. You mean the benefits? The yes, the benefits package. Help health benefits, uh, that is their choice. Yeah. Um, and they, we, we ex it's their choice and it's nothing. It's part of the negotiated bargaining agreement. Right. And uh, this was they the, can choose okay. uh, coverage. We have open enrollment uh, once a year. Thank you. Uh, that's not quite accurate. Um, one contract still in effect, in which case we can't control it. Other contracts are still open which we may ultimately have some say in it, may numbers change. We have placeholders in numerous places with high estimates. Okay. So it may actually come out with a different number depending on how it's negotiated. But you have to put some number in, and we tend to estimate high to be on the safe side when you're creating a budget. So it's, to answer your question technically correct, no. It's not all fixed. We will be fixing a lot of it. The major driver, however, teachers, is fixed right. for this year. We have four contracts out <coughs> in negotiation right now. So. But still, once those contracts are um, uh -huh. sealed or closed, we still, it's personal choice of our staffing, and we don't. Oh, I see. Oh, there's some negotiation around that. Well, okay. the, the, I take who knows time. what yeah, okay. path one may follow. But I, I, I hear you. Thank you. I'm curious. Just make people, people understand that adding 400 some odd thousand dollars into this is to a certain, and I, don't, I won't, you didn't raise this as a topic, but at some point I want to get to it. This is money that's not coming from our local taxpayers. It's one-time money that came from the federal government, and we're not going to have it again. So right now we're looking at increases that we're basically paying for from savings. Isn't that correct? Or reserves, whatever you want to call it. Well, I are you talking about, we did receive some federal funds this year that we're using to offset right. our budget. We're not going to get that year, federal funds. Next year we will funds. not have those Correct. Uh, federal funds. So right now we're paying for some of the increases with about a half a million dollars of money we're not going to have next year. And that's correct. And David, just so you know, at our uh, March 27th workshop, we're going to, we added uh, revenue and funding sources as part of Thank of you. That, that. will just save so, me a lot of questions today then. Just so you're. Is that because I sent you so many questions like that? <laughs> just wondering. And I guess just so everyone looks at the overall context of the budget, I don't, uh, salaries and benefits, um, you know, <coughs> represent over 80 percent of the total uh, expenditures uh, for the district. So, um, obviously, uh, you know, changes in that, even from, you know, uh, you know, two versus four percent, um, 
are, are the largest driver of the incremental change in, in expenditures. What was the date we were adding that to? Re Social revenue, which, which date? Uh, the la uh, March 27th workshop. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Pauline before we move into instructional support? I have one last question. Again, to clarify, Pauline, to clarify that an erroneous newspaper report was claimed that the five, we have a $400,000 increase in new monies to teachers is erroneous. The $400,000 increase in salaries and benefits for our entire school system, That's not correct. just teachers. Correct. And that's a fairly important point to make. Although they're a major driver, that includes a lot of people who aren't teachers. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. As we shift into talking about instructional support, and I think this this is going to be true as we talk about individual building budgets as well. It, you know, as I opened um, our last meeting, the priorities as we look at budgets are number one to meet the needs of students, number two to move the district forward, and thirdly, but really <coughs> um, not significantly involved in the picture of budget development when it begins is being sensitive to the current financial climate. You know, our, our first priority is to look at what are the needs of students. So with that said, um, the instructional support budget is behind the tab titled Instructional Support. Um, we currently are serving approximately 180 students, and the total local budget of $3,003,009 for the 2012 13 is projected. The Instructional Support Department has recommended the reduction of 12 and a half educational technician positions to equal the addition of four special education teacher positions to serve the needs of the students with educational disabilities, K-12. We've taken a K-12 perspective on looking at this and looked then at each individual school and the numbers of staff that we currently have and then thought about very carefully based on the students that we know, the needs of the schools. This is an educational decision, not a budgetary decision. The instructional needs of students warrant full-time special <coughs> education <coughs> teachers who are certified and focused on continuing to narrow the achievement gap, improve student progress, and provide high-quality, explicit instruction. Improvement of student learning depends on students having access to special educators using instructional strategies to meet students' needs in classrooms, in both regular mainstream classrooms and also in pull-out situations. The teacher's expertise and skill to effectively apply these strategies is based on their understanding of student needs, content, of pedagogy, and the context of the learning environment. Having a balanced staffing pattern of 19 certified special educators, which includes a K-12 special educator supporting behavioral needs, and 18 and a half educational technicians to work side by side with both classroom teachers and special educators, will allow us to support students in a variety of settings throughout our schools to continue their work to achieve positive outcomes for students. There are many questions about what this will look like, and so let's take a peek for a minute, and you don't have this in front of you, but um, at the current staffing pattern and the projected staffing pattern. Start at Pond Cove School, where we currently have two resource teachers, a teacher, and I'm going to call it a self-contained program, who serves young people with more multiple needs. One, um, at the moment, we've just added a K-6 special educator, and we have one instructional strategist. We're proposing next year to have four resource teachers, two teachers to serve students with multiple disabilities, and at the moment we're looking at continuing the K-6 position, but that depends solely on student needs, and continue the strategist. We know that early intervention 
Um, we know that providing students with direct instruction is what makes the difference in their success. And we hope that, and we do more than hope, we want to see a narrowing of those um, achieve, the achievement gap that we currently see. Currently, we have some um, amazing educational technicians working at all our schools. The challenge is that we have educators spending a significant amount of time both planning for and then supporting and managing those services. And it is our belief that a teacher directly working with students and reducing that middleman, if you will, um, will make a difference in student achievement. As we look at the middle school, we currently have three resource teachers, one teacher who serves young people with multiple disabilities, and a strategist. We're looking, and a piece of that K-6 person. We're looking next year at four resource teachers, the continuation of one person serving our students with multiple disabilities, and a strategist. How that looks, one thought, and I say one thought because this again, staffing patterns and who serves who and how we place people and what room they're in all depends on multiple um, pieces of the puzzle as, as we put things together for students next year. But having four resource teachers allows us to have one person, one special educator join each grade level team. The opportunity for them to work side by side with their general ed colleagues um, as far as talking about professional learning, sharing strategies, sharing practices, talking about students, intervening quickly, is all um, magnified by having the ability to have one special educator per team. At the high school, we currently have three resource teachers and two teachers who serve our young people with multiple disabilities. Next year, we plan to only add maintain that staffing and to add a strategist. There currently is no strategist at the high school. The K-12 behavior specialist um, will continue to serve students K-12 um, and be part of intervention teams in our district and work directly with teachers and with students. The other services provided in our um, instructional support budget are two speech therapists. We are maintaining the current 1.8 school psychology service. Um, we have put into the budget the one full-time occupational therapist and one full-time CODA, an occupational therapist assistant, and then a .4 occupational therapist um, to serve the remaining numbers that these two professionals can offer. <coughs> The physical therapist, there is a typo there. It should be 0.6 instead of 0.4. She works three days a week. Um, social workers funded by special education funding is, is um, projected at two positions. I'll talk a little bit more about social work in a minute. There is a 1.0 behavior strategist, and then you have 1.0 director. Social work is another piece where there has been some adjustment um, in staffing numbers. Currently at Pong Cove, there are two social workers, projected 1.5. <coughs> Currently at the middle school, there is a 0.6 social worker. We're looking to have a full-time social worker at the middle school next year. Currently at the high school, we have 1.6 social workers. We're looking to have 1.5 social workers next year at the high school. These are all licensed clinical social workers. And licensed clinical social workers are a, a wonderful resource for our students. They, are, um, they bring to us some different skill sets that folks that work in public education aren't quite as used to as those working perhaps in clinics. Um, and so they work really hard to make sure that the kinds of changes that systems are happening in the system are really benefiting the students that they need to serve. And they're also working on activities that help 
a variety of young people make changes in their lives that need to make those changes. This requires a significant amount of planful work on their part. Um, they serve young people both individually and in small groups. Um, and some of the kinds of things they might do for a student individually would be to work on some anger management, some, maybe some family issues that are um, causing stressors, um, anxiety. When we think about the social thinking curriculum that's been put in place, our social workers are very skilled with that and learning every day. And that is the kind of work that happens in small groups. <coughs> They do that with colleagues sometimes. Sometimes our speech therapists work hand in hand with our social workers. And that requires a significant amount of planning so that we are clear about whose role is what and who is doing what for the students so that services are met. This district currently has two out of district placements, one of which was not reflected in the current budget. Um, but nevertheless was there. And we have just um, been notified of a third out of district placement of a young person moving into our district. So the amount of funds that will be expended at this moment projected for next year is $335,664 for out of district placements. As you look at the lines in the budget. Uh, the only increase in the special education budget is $9,000 for summer programming, extended school year programming that's required by <coughs> regulation. You'll see $4,000 in um, contracted services and then back in staffing you'll see the remainder of the money which is under salaries for teachers for the summer and ed techs. want to say that I um, appreciate the correspondence that the board has received and I know Jane and I both have met with a number of parents who've had um, concerns about the proposed changes in the instructional support model um, and I appreciate that while sometimes um, the easiest thing to do is sort of maintain the status quo um, that Jane has worked really carefully with special educators um, with building administrators to think about what's best for kids. Um, and sometimes um, the right road is not the easy road. Um, certainly, you know, the reduction of um, 12 and a half positions, um, 12 and a half, 12 people, 13 people um, losing their jobs or parts of their jobs is not a decision that, that people take lightly. Um, but I believe that Jane and the special educators who came and spoke to the board I think November or December must have been November um, workshop believe strongly that this is the right thing to do for kids um, and I, I appreciate that sure uh, you know um, obviously uh, you know staffing changes um, don't may not reflect up programmatic changes but um, you know a child maybe if you just discuss you know just to give us an example of you know a, a child comes and there's an assessment of their needs and one you know concern we we've heard from from parents you know their child may have you know one-on-one -on -one support this year you know how might that look differently um, you know in the future so is are these changes implying that a child that needs one-on-one, -on -one, you know, support, the resources aren't there, or is it, you know, maybe just flesh that a little bit, because that was kind of the overriding uh, question we received from, from the community. Thanks. Um, <coughs> children who have adult services in their IEPs will continue to have those adult services in their, in school. Um, we aren't reducing or taking away any services that are currently in place for children or that will be put in place in the coming months or that children may need come September. It may not be the same adult 
and that therein lies the challenge, because I know that, um, as Meredith said, this is a very difficult situation for people, and it is the people that make our work, um, and that makes it difficult. But children, safety is number one, and so we never will be placing anyone in a situation that's not safe, and we will not be placing children in situations where they aren't receiving the services that they should have, that they need, and that are in place. Um, there has been a practice in this district to have educational technicians work with resource teachers, and in some cases, educational technicians are working with resource teachers with very small numbers of students, and so we're looking at that kind of service as not being one that it has nothing to do with safety or direct instruction. It is supportive, but we believe that teachers really can do um, that work for students in a, in a, in a more effective manner. And in, in terms of, um, you know, you mentioned one of the considerations was there was a administrative function that teachers uh, you know, special education teacher, rather than providing individual instruction, was having to manage um, a, a group. You know, so I think it's, we're adding, you know, four to four and a half special ed teachers. But can you estimate, is there one teacher, you know, you're freeing up time for current teachers. So is there, what would the comparable increase in the amount of time? Is it, you know, like two more Special ed teachers. Does, does that make sense? Um, the addition of let's let's go around. It. Let's try sure. this and see if this answers your okay. question. I'm not 100 percent sure what the question is, but um, the teachers who continue to serve the young folks that have multiple disabilities and need the extra adult supervision will have the educational technicians working with them. Resource teachers will have smaller caseloads, so they don't need to have educational technicians working with them. So they then are taking the time. The teachers of the young people with multiple disabilities will have smaller caseloads, um, especially at the Pong Cove School. So therefore, they won't be, they still have a couple educational technicians with each of them, but they will have more time to be directly working with children. Um, does that answer? Go ahead, David. Uh, I think I understand the gist. I, I, I was, I think I was sick during this presentation by um, IS in December. But if I understand, if I can generalize, basically we're, we're adding. What, first of all, what's a resource teacher? Is that a is that an IS teacher? Is that uh -huh. a, okay? That's the language that. Um, the words instructional support have been coined by those of us who work in special education, but the um, regulations call them resource teachers. So when you say resource teachers are teaching IS students, that's a one special trained to teach that student? Yes. Okay. Because not, not what a resource teacher was. I understand that basically we're tr trading, for lack of a better word, ed techs for more IS teachers. Correct. And the theory is that IS teachers can... Um, and provide, um, by your model, more direct teaching and provide the same type of services because they're, they're, a, they're a higher level. The ed techs are providing maybe some services they're not quite qualified for, so it's better to hire. I guess when I'm exchanging 14 ed techs for four new IS teachers, we're better off because they're better trained and they can handle more people and the people who need one-on-one -on -one receive it from the remaining group or other resources. Is that Correct. a fair summary? That's a fair summary. I, I did notice that it seemed to be front-loaded. These peop new people seem to be going to K through 4. But Correct. we're taking ed techs from K through 4 and 5 through 8. And Therefore, K-12. Okay, well, how do people go into K through 4 and taking away people from 5 through 8 and 8 through 12 help the people in 5 through 12. So we are looking at a total number of educational technicians, K-12, 
Correct. Then we look at a number of teachers, K-12. And teachers are being assigned per building. And then educational technicians, quite frankly, won't be assigned until June when we have finished IEPs, we have met our new incoming kindergartners, and we know where the needs are. This is the kind of process that this year is very transparent because we're here and we're talking about a change in how we're doing our work. But this is the kind of work that happens or should happen every single year in special education. From my experience, it is what I've done for a lot of years in looking at staffing for special education. And that is we have to look at the children and what they need, K-12, and then we look at the resources we have, K-12, and we assign them. So I can sit here tonight with all the confidence in the world and tell you that X amount of teachers will be at Pond Cove and five new students will move into the high school and that will shift our resources. It won't be more resources, it will just be placement of resources differently to meet student needs. Does that help? It helps slightly, but I'm not sure it directly answers my question. I, I, I simply look at raw numbers. You want to try, Meredith? I do. Okay. First, let me say, though, <laughs> that, that if we get five new students and they have needs that are beyond what we currently have the staffing to support, that Jane's going to come see Pauline and I and say we have needs that are beyond the <laughs> Our, our existing staffing and we need to add resources and we're, we're going to come up with a plan about how to do that and we're going to come and talk to you about what changes we need to make in order to make that happen. But to get back to your question, why do we front load? Because we know that um, early intervention makes I, it I, I don't have any, I think I can figure out why you front load. I think okay. I've heard, heard the explanation, it's better to get them early. Yeah. I understand that, I can grasp that. But you're taking away from five, 5 through 12, and I assume that those people were needed. What what's being done if all our money is being shifted? We're saving people, but by taking them from five through eight, but putting them in K through four. What are we doing for the five through? Um, excuse me, five through twelve. So, uh, in Jane's summary, she identified two additional positions at five through twelve. Okay. Um, but but two other additional positions, plus about a three-quarter position, or a two-thirds position at least, depending, in the K-6 literacy position that would also be at the elementary school. So two-plus positions at the elementary level. Um, children change, children grow, children's needs develop, and so the staffing plan reflects those needs. But also, as children age, they tend to develop more independent skills. They tend to require, and again, this, is, this varies tremendously because we're talking about 180 students who have a wide variety of needs, um, but that, that what you hope is if you have service children very well when they are young, that as they age, they're going to be less dependent on supports. So I, I don't think this plan is taking away resources that exist currently in that we're adding a teacher in both of the other buildings or one at 5-8 and one at 9-12, but we're intensifying the support at the elementary level. Okay, I think the last sentence answered my question. Okay, good. You are good. taking care of the loss of ed techs by adding a teacher, five, two teachers, 5 through 12, Correct. but um, front-loading, so the front-loading of K through 4 is not subtracting from 5 through 12 because we're adding teacher positions to there. Correct. Okay, I can understand that. And is it fair to say, you know, even though a child may need less services given that each child is it's so different that we don't know so what is the school board we need to look at is you know what are the needs of the child on the yearly basis and provide the resources because you know the mix given their disabilities given each child's different that it, it's really going to be a, a year to year uh, assessment so no but yes so the job to look at what the individual needs are belongs to the IEP team, um, okay. not well, to the board. I, I, yeah, I don't mean but, okay. but what the board is going to see is that services and staffing are dynamic and that they are based on where the student needs are. You know, Jane talked about the social work need. Right now, there's a greater social work need that has emerged at the middle school level. In fact, our, one of our elementary social workers is currently covering time at the middle school because those needs exist. Um, and is spending part of the time there now. So, 
you know, our, uh, we want to can give you as much information as we can, but we recognize that, you know, this is a dynamic process. IEPs usually aren't done, you know, at the stage of the game that you're writing budgets, and Jane, um, and having held Jane's position um, in, the, in another district in my life, I recognize that it, special ed does a lot of forecasting. It knows what the current needs are. It knows what the historical trends have been around um, how many students have moved in, what changes have we expected, what's happened with incoming, you know, preschool students. Um, and it and it plans accordingly. Um, and I I know that Jane has worked very closely um, with, um, in particular, the strategists um, and instructional support staff in the buildings to look at existing needs and to project forward what they believe the needs will be for the next budget cycle. And yes, this will probably look different next year because those needs are going to continue to change. The first, maybe I'm slow, but I, I've heard for the first time a K through 12 IS specialist. First I've heard of it in three years. Mm -hmm. Has there always been one? No. Okay, so is this a new position and could you explain it? It's not a new position. Um, it's a person who works, has worked here for four or five or six years, I believe. So when I came, there is a, under the contracted services, which comes out of our local entitlement federal monies, there's a consultant that comes in for um, a significant amount of money. And he is a, what's called a BCBA. He's a behavior specialist who works with young people specifically who are on the autism spectrum. But he also has worked with other young people in our district who have demonstrated some rather challenging behaviors. That's a very expensive service that we have going, um, and we still have him. So when I began to look at the qualifications and the skill set of the staff that we have, it came to my attention that um, Sonia Croft, who is the person we're talking about, the K-12 behavior specialist, is just about finished with receiving her BCBA, and we'll have that in the fall. That will allow us to make some adjustments to our local entitlement expenditures, which makes me really happy. Um, but more importantly than that, for sure, is that Sonia is here full time, possesses skills that allow her to work K-12 very effectively and efficiently. Um, has The district has invested a significant amount of money in her learning all about social thinking, and she does a great job of working with not only with our students with that, but with our staff so that they can learn it and embed it into their work. So as we looked at adjusting how we were serving our elementary school students this year, because we had more needs than we had staff, we made some adjustments in shuffling around, and um, Sonia then became available to us K-12. She's been working with that consultant, so she's been getting extra supervision and support and learning, so it's benefited all of us. So. It wasn't an addition, it was a... Well, uh, I don't want to wordsmith with you, but it is a new yes. position, but not a new person. Is that correct? Did we have a K through 12 behavioral specialist title we person? We didn't have that title before. Okay, now. so now we're creating that title, but we're um, fulfilling that role with an existing person and lessening of some consultants? Yes. Okay. Next year. So it is technically a new job title, and I would call that a position, but it's not creating a new employed person. It's not adding somebody, actually consolidating and um, expanding somebody's role. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jane, um, in terms of Sonia's position, this is the position that will provide the social skills curriculum work to grades one and two, or K-1, is that right, or no? No, that, that's currently being provided through guidance and social work at Conoco. Okay. Sonia and supports that. Sonia, Sonia supports, supports that. that. Right. Okay, um, we received some comments from teachers who were concerned about, mm -hmm. um, um, about getting the support that they needed yeah. in order to continue the work that, that's been started in that regard. And, um, 
can you explain to me, you may have done this already, but can you explain it again, how that will be provided in those classes? That will continue to be provided by guidance and by Sonia next year. Okay. Um, and currently it's provided by Bree Gallagher. 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 I think she's here. Oh, Bree's here. Okay. Oh. I didn't recognize her. She's tiny. I know. Um, Bree Gallagher and um, Patty Blankenship, Chip Babineau. Those are the two social workers, Patty and Chip, and also Sonia. So when we look at reducing the social work service, the amount of um, guidance slash social work service plus Sonia will allow us to continue to provide that. I don't see in any way that that will be interrupted. Okay. And have we had the opportunity to speak with um, the teachers about that so they have that information? Or as Tom, Tom, have you had the opportunity to speak with them too? No, I haven't. Um, we, we've talked to about the, their concerns. the people most directly involved, and uh, I didn't think there would be any change. So if, if I had thought there was going to be um, a lower level of support, I would have brought it up as a change. I would have mentioned it, but I, I think the program will continue. Okay. So we're all set there. I think, right, I think people were concerned, okay. and I wanted to wait until at least this was public to address those concerns. In terms of the, um, the shift of methodology, um, um, I'm assuming um, that there are many other schools who use this same methodology that you're talking about in terms of um, uh, not relying so heavily on the paraprofessionals mm -hmm. and relying more on, um, on resource room teachers. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the experience those schools have had? I mean, do you have any any information that you can give us in terms of um, how the transition years look? And um, because I know for families it will be a very difficult transition, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate um, all of the letters that, that we have received and the concerns. Um, but I, I certainly have a lot of faith in you and your experience, and Meredith and your experience, and. Um, just wondering if we can um, share the vision with, with um, and I know you've done a lot of meeting out in the public, and I don't know if there are more meetings scheduled, but, um, you know, just to continue to work with these families to um, address their apprehensions and, um, and their concerns. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, can you tell us what success looks like in, in the new model? So um, a couple of things. There is a parent-teacher PCPA coming up on uh, two weeks from tomorrow where I will, um, three weeks, sorry, um, go and um, they have offered us 15 minutes before they start with a great presentation that we have. So um, we'll continue to talk about this. So I can say to you that my experience is that when I was the director in Yarmouth, um, we experienced the same kind of shift from educational technicians um, to more teachers and less educational technicians. Um, that shift was difficult in that there were 12 educational technicians impacted at the time. The economy was a bit different in that um, through attrition and uh, folks making career decisions. Many of them were certified teachers that they moved into teaching positions. But we shifted from educational technicians in resource rooms to having educational technicians working only with our teachers who served our young people who had multiple disabilities. Um, I can say to you that the success was twofold. One, our um, academic achievement of our young people with IEPs improved, and it improved significantly quickly um, within a couple years. And the reason was that teacher caseloads were smaller, teacher work was um, direct with the students. We were very focused on professional learning and improvement of our skill set. Um, in that department, in our K-12 special education department in Yarmouth, and 
um, quite frankly, they were driven, and so we were driven to improve our practices so that our children's scores improved. We had very high numbers of referrals when I first went to Yarmouth. We had very high numbers of young people identified. Those numbers reduced in both referrals and in numbers of young people identified. There were some um, misidentification that, that as children's skills improved, it became clear that they could really learn just beautifully in the general education population, so they were dismissed from special education. Our numbers of referrals reduced because, number one, we had more special education teachers. Number two, we had very active um, intervention teams that included special education teachers. And we put in place some very specific, explicit interventions so that when a child was experiencing difficulty learning, we put in place an educator who had the skills. didn't matter whether they were certified special education or general education. They worked with the student, and for the most part, the referrals that were made were referrals that were good referrals and became identified as having disabilities. The others, the students made progress and returned to their classrooms and were successful. Um, so I've seen it be positive. It really isn't any... Um, it really is all about good teaching, good instruction, people learning, professionals learning. Professionals need to be very focused and explicit in their instruction of young people with disabilities. One of the challenges that we face, and this is a conversation I was having today with the high school special educators, and this is a common challenge in any high school, is that we have young people who have needs to learn skills still. And we have young people, those same young people, come to us with their assignments and they need to get them done. And we understand that. But if we spend all our time helping them get them done, we're not spending our time teaching them the skills that are driven by their IEPs and that they need. So we talked about a balance and how to balance that and developing a learning center model where students come and we talk with them about what specific skills they need and we work on those for a piece of the time, and then a piece of the time we work on that with them applying those <coughs> to get their work done. Um, we put that in place in Yarmouth, and our teachers spent a couple of years doing action research on that, and the impact it made on student learning and the ability of the students to then learn how to manage their curriculum and their content was, was significant and, and improved. Their skill set? and their anxiety reduced and their work got done, which is huge for high school students. So we were talking about that today at the high school and um, dreaming a little bit about what that might look for us mm -hmm. in the coming years. Does that help? It does. It does help to know that, you know, a school so close to us has experienced the same sort of shift and done well. heard you say, and I, I trust that this is an educational shift, and this is really designed to improve the education of our students, and um, uh, it, you know, it's encouraging to hear that the shifts happen, happen quickly. And, um, I'm assuming we will, um, for students who are used to having um, paraprofessionals, mm -hmm. um, there will be some sort of transition for them to get them ready um, for independent learning. And well, again, students who have our ed techs working with them will continue to have what they need. Mm -hmm. It may not be an ed tech, it may be a teacher. Okay. Having more teachers offers us the opportunity for co-teaching. Right. Um, offers us the opportunity for teachers to be working in and out of classrooms, a lot more flexibility. Um, and, and it offers special educators and general educators the opportunity to partner up and learn from each other so that m multiple children are served. Go Just ahead. to add, um, and I sent this article to the board and I brought some copies, but um, 
sort of took me back reading this to um, when I was a K-6 principal um, and um, when the building I was in made a similar shift. Um, we reduced um, paraprofessionals as they were referred to in that district and hired um, a couple of additional special education teachers, again, the trade. Um, but, uh, you know, as part of that, we had in what at the time were called critical friends groups, which is really a precursor to special learning communities in general idea, which is that um, teachers are working collaboratively to talk about instruction and um, what's in the best interest of students. That this particular article is one that we read as a whole staff. Um, and so as I was <laughs> sifting through things and, um, you know, I think certainly, um, again, there's, there's, the board has received a lot of correspondence in recent days, but I, but I think that many of the things in this article still hold um, very true today. I mean, this is research that date back, dates back um, a decade now um, through the University of Vermont, but that, that identified um, challenges in putting paraprofessionals um, into roles that really needed to be filled by teachers. Um, that that um, there's a line that says um, some students with disabilities spend the majority of their instructional day with paraprofessionals. These practices are double standards that likely would be unacceptable if suggested for students without disabilities. And it, it, our paraprofessional staff um, at the time was part of our critical friends group. They were part of our professional learning community, so they were part of these conversations. And it's really hard to separate the personal um, rapport with students, the individuals who are involved from um, the picture of, of what, what are the instructional needs of kids. Um, but I'm, I'm proud, I guess, to say that um, as a K-6 staff and as we looked at the research and as we talked about the needs of our students, as a community, we came um, to the decision that, that reducing some paraprofessional staff um, and increasing teachers was in the best interests of our students. Um, I haven't been directly involved in those conversations here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I had the luxury, I guess, of, of time um, as, a, as a building principal to have those conversations with staff. But I think um, I also saw the results of that over my time in the building, and what I saw was um, improved practice um, on both the part of our special educators and our regular education classroom teachers, um, much more discussion and um, seeking of information from one another about how to plan thoughtfully um, for all students in the classroom. Um, I, I, I think that having worked in special education, that um, I'm going to step back even further than this decade, but um, you know, I think that often special education has been more reactive than proactive, um, and it, you know, this goes back to sort of that point about early intervention. What we know is that being proactive works much better, um, and so I, I saw that. I lived that um, as a building administrator. I'd be happy to. <laughs> help you talk with parents from that district um, uh, if, if that would be helpful. But I, I, again, I think that, uh, you know, the initial focus is what's best for our kids. And I, I think that piece continues to ring true today. And um, So your school had success with that shift as well. Uh, And there's no, you know, I, again, I think every community has different needs. And, you, you know, there's no formula. There's no magic to this. This is about what do individuals need. Um, and, and then it's sitting down and putting those pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, just for the up names, because I used to be a trial lawyer, for the people in the television audience, we handed out an article that's called The Paraprofessional Conundrum, Why We Need Alternative Support Strategies. It's by a, a gentleman named G-I-N-G-R-E-C-C-O and 
Bro. Jean Greco. Whatever. B R O E R. If anybody wants to look up, the point is that there is research backing this model. We've heard two personal case studies backing this model. This may seem radical to Cape Elizabeth, but it's not radical in both research and in terms of practice. So I, I think that's something I've learned tonight, which is important, and that if people want to see this research to feel more comfortable, I just gave the two names. They can Google this. They can get other documents from, I'm sure. You can post it? Um, we can, uh, yeah, so they can get, they can contact you for other articles, and we've gotten two personal experiences in two different districts where this model has worked. Um, but that's enough reassurance for people for change. It's sufficient evidence for me that it's worth a shot. And, and quite frankly, it seems logical to me to move from more specialized and educated people who can deal more directly with the issues as, um, versus people who are slightly less trained, but I'm not saying that they're not excellent people, but it seems to me a model that does make sense. Um, and so, supported by research, supported by two case studies here, and um, apparently by our relative staffs. It, it, the concerns seem to be mostly in the letters I read, have you thought about this, and this seems so weird to me, and I guess what I've heard tonight is, it's, we have thought about it, at least our staff has, and there is a lot of support both research-wise and um, actual life practice-wise to support this. Now I'll shut up. Uh, extremely coincidentally, at the same time that we were discussing this wound, um, Meredith, the middle school teachers, and I went to a presentation at the University of Southern Maine by David Silverman. I think the comparative data that you're referencing, Steve, was from uh, Falmouth, Yarmouth, and um, SAD 51. I think those were the three other districts um, whose high-performing, more efficient research information the group looked at that day. I just want to say, um, because we have been in the culture of working with ed techs, and they've been excellent with our um, students, it's just very hard um, to lose 12. Uh, I don't even want to, I don't want to own the number of position of ed tech positions um, because it, we are a school and a community and losing 12 people, uh, gaining four, but losing 12 is hard, is a hard concept and it's hard uh, in reality. So I just want to I understand it was a hard decision, and um, that's why so we've taken so long to talk about it, because it's very difficult to grasp. Um, but thank you for the work, you, and thank you for the work that the um, ed techs have done. And I can only imagine that it's difficult in the schools right now, in the actual hallways of the schools and teachers' rooms, um, living with what's put it down on paper. So. Um, 
thank you administrators for being extra kind or whatever the work you do um, to be professional. I don't know how to end this, but thank you. Does anyone else have a question regarding this? I just had a quick question about the uh, reduction in social work staff at Pond Cove, mm -hmm. and it sounds like people feel comfortable with it, and I just would, I'd like a, just a better understanding of how the 0.5 loss will still be able to support the current curriculum and need at the, in that situation. So the middle school currently has 0.6, and they need a full-time social worker. So, and we have two full-time social workers right now at Pond Cove, and as you heard, one of them is, it's really not that far to get to the school and back, um, goes to the middle school and helps out there. So if we're looking at K-8, we really will have two and a half social workers, am I correct? I think that's correct, next year, um, serving them, and one and a half at the middle, at the high school. So. The reduction was to fund the additional time at the middle school so we could have a full-time person, and we really need a full-time one person. So we have continuity. Continuity of care is important. Um, last year, the district made a decision when they hired at the Hong Kong School for their guidance department. I, there was a decision made that a social worker would be hired, and there was also a full-time social worker being hired at the uh, with special education funds. Um, the reality is that one and a half clinical social workers at the Hong Kong School plus the guidance service is really well, really a wonderful abundance of service for the children. Um, so we don't look at them as losing anything, although I know that sounds ridiculous for me to say that, but I know that <laughs> I don't think we're losing any service for our children. I'm not sure that was helpful, but. So it's, a, it's a, basically the, it's an allocation of resources. It sounds like one person, it, it's, you know, if you reduce something by half a person, you know, me, you know it sounds like that, that time will be reallocated to the middle school. Mm -hmm. So, so in a really scenario a that, Based on what you've discussed before, if the needs prove to be greater, uh, you know, when we look at in the school year, we'll say, okay, what resources do we need to allocate to, to meet those needs? So based on what we know today, it looks like there's a, you know, less than a one-time position at the middle school. There's greater than one at the elementary school, and to make them more comparable, we're reallocating time from that uh, from that resource to the to the middle school David. Uh, to change the topic slightly from power professional versus teacher which I think has been eloquent, eloquently um, discussed and it sounds logical to me that this kind of a hit this word but paradigm shift is, is a good move the other thing I noticed that there is a change, I'm going to go back to, it's a K through 12 uh, special educator uh, behavioral person. Doesn't that add something in the sense that we now have somebody who has overall responsibility for continuity, for lack of a better word, continuity of K care from K through 12, yes. which is a new thing, which I cannot believe, I, I'm, I'm going to ask the obvious, isn't that a good thing? I happen to think it's an awesome thing, and here's okay. why. Um, little people coming in who are presenting challenges, are, either are on the autism spectrum or not, um, have multiple needs and in, in behaviors, demonstrating those, transitioning them between schools and moving them along the continuum so they be, go from needing a lot of intervention to being independent at the high school is huge. Um, the continuity of care, as, as you say, and that's a great way to explain it, continuity of care has been, at least from what people have reported to me, um, not as strong between fourth and fifth, and not as strong for sure between eight and nine. Mm -hmm. And um, this year we have a, a new teacher at the high school working with our young people with multiple needs and also
also with the benefit of having Sonia there, um, I think it's fair enough to say that I've seen some amazing progress with the young people, and so have their parents. So. Well, I, I just want to say that that seems to me to be a major plus to the shift. I'm, I'm a firm believer that we need more K through 12 integ vertical integration mm -hmm. of our services here, and that seems to be what we'll be getting from this person. Uh, into the schools. Do you want to start with uh, Ponco? Sure. Let me start by, by following up um, about the new model. I should say that we um, use the same priorities and what we call regular education for years. Instead of using federal money, say, to go not to tell them behind the tax, we've invested in reading teachers for years. This is a broader model, and I think that's going to work even better. The, um, I'll just give you a little history. I'll start with resources for early intervention gives us the opportunity to do just that. With the additional professional teachers at Pond Cove, if somebody in grades three or four is having difficulty in math, that child will get math help from whoever's available, whether it's regular or special. So <coughs> shifting those resources has actually added more capacity to Pond Cove. So instead of asking you for more money from, from the regular ed side to have a math support teacher or have Maybe just because uh, I know for the last few years there's been discussion on the, you know the I think it was called the math lab or the uh, math support. So due to the addition of it sounds like resource uh, teachers, um, there'll be more resources there that can provide a dedicated uh, math support. Not that there's not current math support there, but a, a specific um, support program. Yes, and that the, the math support which was concentrated in grades K through 2 is now extending through the work of the assessment that we've done. We now know instead of having students who are struggling a little bit master every small skill, we've identified the major skills along the way. And the people in structural support and classroom teachers have agreed on this uh, assessment continuum which goes K through 4. Um, so again, it, no matter where you are, you should get the help you need in the, in the area you need it. Jane has said um, frequently this, as Debbie's demonstrated, this helps her be temporary. Um, so we'll be right back to her hands. So is um, the math lab, sorry to.
completely paid for by the school system now, and so. it's no longer um, contributed by uh, Kate Elizabeth Seif Educational Foundation. It's great. I have a question. Um, is that right, Michael? Sure. Um, Will you tell me about the uh, change in the reading recovery? I know we've lost one reading recovery teacher has um, retired, and so we'll now be having, uh, I know our emphasis is on literacy. Is there any change? To, tell me about that. You mean last year? Um, this year. Th th don't I see in line number, um, on page four. It's staff yes. development, not a, oh. not a uh, the expenses for the schools uh, that you have in your book are expenses other than salaries and benefits. Okay, so. thank you. Oh, sorry. But does it represent? Thank you. Um, it partially answer to your question, I think, is that, yes, we had a teacher retire last, the end of last June, correct? He was a reading recovery teacher. That's what you're getting back to. I guess I thought it was this year we just heard a retirement. I'm no. Wrong. Okay, sorry. No. Um, and we hired a reading specialist yes. um, the start of this year. Okay. So it's still three. I think that the, now I understand what you're saying. Okay. It, it's, that fee is for professional development for the reading recovery teachers. And that's the word I got when I had budget times. It's $1,200. Yes. That line that goes from mm -hmm. 6,000 to 30, I'm sorry, 3,600, 6,000 to 3,600, so yes. $1,200. Yes. And the reading specialist you're asking about is both reading recovery trained as well as trained in other methods. Um, so we still pay for the reading recovery training. Okay. That is your question, Kate? It does, okay. yeah. Sorry, I got my years mixed up. <laughs> I just have a small question on in health services. I, I noticed um, across the board we have about an $876 or $877 reduction in each school. What is, what's that we supply? Answer, we? We, we do. We do. <laughs> well, I, actually, I'm proud to say that I actually thought I knew a possible answer to that question at the beginning of the day uh, because I had a conversation very early on um, with the nurses about AED batteries. Um, I remember those and batteries. And that is so expensive. The AED batteries are the cause. Okay. Uh, we replaced them this year. They're not due for replacement again for two years. So that good to, yeah. is the decrease. I can remember looking at those in last year's budget and saying, really, for batteries? <laughs> Oh, that's good to know they last you want the, That's right. You want them there. But you definitely yeah. do. It's good to know they last year. Um, Tom, I, I'm going to ask this of each one of the schools. We've had a presentation from the high school a bit about the use of uh, professional learning communities, committees, whichever term you want to use, which where for the audience, the TV audience, is basically teachers getting together and try to coordinate uh, curriculum within a school, horizontal, and within from grade 12 to grade 9, which is vertical. Is there anything done in the Pond, in Pond Cove in terms of professional learning communities or anything like that to try to coordinate a, uh, uh, again, I'll use a continuum of curriculum from K through 4, and then the shift from Pond Cove to middle school. I'm particularly interested in the shift from Cove to middle school. Is there any work being done in that regard to try to coordinate what the people are coming out of Pond Cove, are they ready for middle school? And is there a coordination between middle school teachers and Pond Cove teachers in terms of what do they need to know and do they know it? Dave, can I make one suggestion? We did, this is a workshop. It sounds like you're focusing on transitions between the schools and also K through 12 curriculum. And that was, uh, we're going to have a workshop on that. We identified at our, the board retreat. So if, uh, just because we have a fair amount to go through, I'm just mindful of the time. If you have a budget-related question. Well, the question would be if they're not, my question, well, I, I don't want to enter into a debate about everything is budget, okay? okay? 
problem is everything is money related. If they're not coordinating between Pond Cove and Middle School, we're spending money in the high school for that kind of work. Are we spending that money in Pond Cove? If, if not, why not? Okay. Because I think it's important work that maybe I don't see in this description, I don't see in the budget, and maybe I'd, I'd vote to add it. Okay. So I am tying it to okay. money, even though it doesn't sound like it. Okay. Th thank you for clarifying. So I'm actually asking if you if you're doing it, great. Yeah. Uh, and if you're not, you need money to do it. them more clearly. I think I'm answering your question for that way. To me, that's going to be the big coordination. What do we want the kids to know? How are we going to know they did it? And then when they've reached that goal. So the assessment is the key piece. That's the work we've been doing with Tammy and Claire for a couple of years. Right. And those are outside consultants that cost us money. Are we still able to continue that work? Yeah, we're, we're doing it. Without any earmarked funds for that? I, I don't see any earmarked funds for... Uh, yeah, I mean, both in the district-wide professional development, which is later, but also on page 19, um, which shows you the, it, of salaries, the salaries and benefits tab is the co-curricular and team leader and department head stipends. And um, the practice has been that those team leaders, department heads, are generally the professional learning community coordinators. Now, could you tell me again what tab? Because yes. I was focused on the Pond Cove tab. Salaries and Silver, benefits silly tab. Silly of me to do that. And I, I understand the conundrum. Which are the tab and where is that? No, I, it, Salaries I, and benefits, <laughs> page 19. And there's some work being done um, through the co-curricular committee to look at um, those job descriptions to make sure that they reflect the professional learning community responsibilities um, because these job descriptions predate really the professional learning community work in the district but those people are the people doing the PLC coordination and they're receiving a stipend to support that work. Well, thank you very much for pointing it out because I did not understand why that what that money was being used for but it wasn't under the Pond Cove tabs so when I asked the question about it. so basically this hundred and twelve some odd thousand dollars is now being used and it's funded for each school to try and uh, advance PLCs in what I call horizontal and vertical integration of curriculum. Is that how you're doing it? Through team leaders and department heads? Professional development time. But you're doing it through these, Correct. as Mary said, through these people and, with, and funded this way that's already in our budget. And the building administrators who, who are leading the curriculum committees okay. as well. You've answered my question. What I want to see is there and it's being funded and it's in our existing budget. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Unless anyone has a question, why don't we uh, move into the middle school? all posted online.
professional support for literacy. title in the job that she's been doing at Pine Cove. I'm not sure if she just loves working with us, if she takes pity on us and says, I need to really bridge that. So she has really stepped up volunteers to do that work, and, and, the, and the staff is, is enjoying it. It's been a really nice share. We've also had two.
it's unusual to have a drop be specifically in one grade. When you drop across the school, you usually drop three or four, or five or six, something like that. There is a drop of uh, 22 students in going into seventh grade next year. That's where we're able to carve out that half-time position for the lead literacy. Um, we are, uh, it, it, one of the questions that John and I thought might be of interest to people or come up is that if you look at grades six and seven, excuse me, five and six, it says that there are seven teachers plus a world language or six teachers plus a world language. And then if you look at grades seven and eight, you might say, well, those grades then look like they have a little bit better class ratio when in fact the class ratios are the same across the school, are the same. The reason they look a little bit better is because in grades six and seven, world language is not a standing 45 minute class. It's four days a week, 20 minutes in the fifth grade, it's five days a week, a half an hour in the sixth grade. So by the time kids get to seventh grade, they begin a 45 minute class and that's put into the uh, regular daily schedule for them. So when you see that next year in grade seven, there will be uh, seven staff members, that really means six content area teachers and a world language teacher on team. And in grade eight, where it says eight, that's really seven plus the world language position. So the ratios in the classes will be the same. Um, one of the considerations that always is interesting at the middle school and high school level is the scheduling and having enough seats and how uh, how numbers of classes and kids who are in certain programs when you start to, to uh, create levels of programs, how those round out. For instance, next year in the seventh grade, we believe we're going to see approximately 50 students in one level of math. So if you have 50 students, is that, and, and now in March, we're saying 50. So is that two groups of 25 that you plan and hope that those stay put? Is it three groups of, uh, we have um, 33 students scheduled for algebra in the seventh grade next year. We, so it's going to be a, you know, a 16 and a 17, the way it looks. And in the transition math poll, we have one section of that that's going to be a slightly smaller class because that's it's one section. That's how many students are going to fall into it. Also, in grade eight, we have 29 students that are going to be in algebra. Are you going to offer one algebra for 29, or are you going to offer a class of 14 and a class of 15? I'm going to have room in the 7th and 8th grade classroom for 29 seats. Um, and then we also, in one of the other math levels that we have, that is a great bridge between students who are moving out of the instructional support or out of some, or still in some of those RTI tiers. It's kind of like a controlled map. They may take a transition map part one. And that happens to be to look like for next year, capable of about nine students for a teacher. You know, if it's, if it's 14 or 15, that's one thing. If it's nine, that happens to be the number. So we're we're going to continue to work within the existing staff that we have to meet these kinds of needs, to do the inclusionary models, to dovetail better with the work and the uh, and take better advantage of the instructional support work collaboration and to make sure that we have our literacy support that will be a great bridge between the work that's happening at Pond Cove to the middle school and the high school. Um, one other piece that you probably would have noted in uh, Jeff Thorak's presentation if you switch back to athletics on page two. Up here, perhaps an additional $4,000 has been budgeted to return middle school athletics back to the school budget for uh, from the table of the community services. The remainder of the middle school athletic expenses, team traveling officials, will be covered in an annual per student athletic fee of $70. So if, if we have, on average, over the last few years, 271 students, is that what I think the count is, um, and each family contributes at one time, whether the student plays three or four sports in a season and participates in other activities, or whether they're involved in one activity, the 
$70 contribution, then that's a total revenue of $19,000, which leads to a $4,000 gap in the projected expense of $23,000. So we're, we're uh, you know, it was an interesting experiment to try to, uh, to bridge the, the really difficult budget terms. We had a couple of years ago when we had a $38,000 gap in that area. And now that we, at, at this point, what we see is that it really looks like a $23,000 expense when we're trying to buy some of that back. Um, would we love to have a program that is uh, completely funded through the schools? Yes. Will we offer hardship opportunities for students? Yes. Will we turn kids away? Nope. Um, would we also love to completely fund a Chwanky program? We would well, you know, there are, there are a number of things that we could say that just not realistic right now, but a $70 one-time fee would, uh, just help me out here, I think it's $45 a, uh, a sport right now is a one-time $25. Okay, so I actually have that right. Uh, nice job. Yeah. <laughs> Scary. Um, so, you know, a student could participate in, if, if you're lucky enough, you could participate in a fall sport, you could participate in two winter sports, whether it's the indoor track or basketball or basketball or swimming, and an, and an outdoor sport. So you could be paying $180 plus the $25, $205 during the school year to be a child to participate. And at the middle school level, we want to encourage kids to try as many different things as they can without the fear of a parent saying, geez, I don't know, we're not sure that this might be a good match for you and it's going to cost us this money, why don't, why don't we think about trying something else? I, say, I think Jeff Gorff will talk more about that right. when we visit athletics. Uh, the question that came to us was about the uh, software line and the reduction in that. Uh, it says, please explain the reduction in software. How was that software used? What was the software program used? While you're on the subject of textbooks, and, and maybe this has all changed since the fundraising was done several years ago, but ha has the budget um, kept up with the need to replace textbooks in the middle school since that, that time? Um, first of all, the, the, the textbook hand group did such an incredible job that we really uh, were able to, we were 
place the world language, most of the social studies, all of the social studies, the uh, updated the math series, and the literature anthologies, um, probably oh, this, uh, I can't remember the kind of books that you're on that chapter now. I thought there were science is, books, too. Aside from science. So, um, that's, those are in great shape, and that was a seven-year site license, and we were two years down, we've got five years to go on those. Um, actually, some of my questions have been answered, and some of them I think you're going to ask me to punt them. But um, you can tell me to punt some of these. I'm still going to ask them. Uh, one that uh, I'm curious, you're creating through uh, a, uh, a one-half-time literacy teacher, yet we're hiring a full-time K-12 through literacy teacher. Yep. Why do we need both? Yep.
issue that with uh, the Canadian Clearing Task Force and the penny penalties. But if we could take some of that money instead and have some K to 12 coordination of what's going on, and, and I need people, I need somebody who can take the lead literacy person that I have and continue to ramp up that person's knowledge and feed that person and model as well. So it's 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 as though what we're looking at is we've got a district coordination of the of everything that's happening educationally, and we've got training sessions that this person is organizing, whether it's summer training or or in school. Uh, Jane and I are currently working on uh, starting tomorrow a, a, a leadership seminar, and I know Tom and Jane are working on one. So doing those kinds of seminar opportunities for people, I think there's great great value. In yeah, I, I guess I would say, you know, as as we had the position shift at the high school, Jeff and I had kind of a lengthy conversation, and, and I think um, the middle school has been in a difficult position over the past couple of years. It sort of borrowed resources from the elementary school and borrowed resources in the form of Linda and borrowed resources from the high school in the form of Angela to try to fill a gap. Um, and so given that... They have an opportunity to fill that position and have a person on site for a concentrated period of time really moving forward the work that's been done at the middle school through these splinter people. I, I, I think it's, it, it's uh, again, good <laughs> money in the short term. Um, I think it's going to sort of double our professional development opportunities at the middle school level. It's going to bolster the work that's been done. It's going to give people direct feedback on the assessments that they're doing on, a right, on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, a, a K-12 person certainly can do that, but I think we've neglected the middle school enough um, that it makes sense to allocate some resources there in the short term. Okay, your last part came close to answering my question. Mm -hmm. If we're funding a K through 12 literacy person full time, mm -hmm. um, it sounds to me like we now have that person really working Pawn Cove and high school and not the middle school because the middle school has their own. I disagree because in well, essence, I'm just saying it sounds like it. I and, understand, and, and I, I, I haven't yet heard why. If the high school can give up and Pawn Cove doesn't need it, why this person is not capable with however much of ninety thousand dollars we're paying them the benefits, why they can't service the middle school need as well. I, I, I think the answer is not is that they could. However, we have, sh I think, because we've only sort of partway plugged in the resources at the middle school in the prior years, um, you know, the middle school has done really well with the support of the people it's had and with the, the support of their administrators and the teachers who are working as part of these task forces, but they haven't received the same level of benefit that Pond Cove has, which is going to need a, a little bit different kind of support and work, and the support that the high school has had in the form of Angela is going to need a little bit different level of support. Each of our schools is a different place. Um, we need to fill a gap that has been created at the middle school by not putting resources directly at the middle school. So they need more, so they need more time yeah. than uh, uh, K-12. Okay, this is probably going to be the best answer I get, but I, and, and it's going to have to involve I trust you because I don't understand why if I'm hiring somebody full-time for $90,000, if middle school needs that person the most, why doesn't that person go to middle school the most? I mean, why can't that person carve out the initial part of their time with the initial part of their work and service the middle school. Why are we hiring somebody for $90,000 and a person half time for the middle school? Either this person can do K through 12 or they can't. And what I think my answer is yes, but there's a bigger hole to fill at middle school. And for at least, and is, that, is that the answer? There's a big hole and therefore this K through 12 person. I think it. I think that is the answer, and I think it gets back to that issue of sort of front-loading resources. We we've we've had resources at the high school, and that's been great, and it's been very beneficial to those students. But if you're thinking about the fact that students have reading or writing challenges, wouldn't it make sense to address those earlier? And yes, that's probably the most complete answer you're going to get from me. I don't know if Steve well, wants to I'll add give, more to that. I'll give you an example of what I see. Um, I, I sent an email out.
set up an appointment with Sally Cameron to come in and see me to present um, two, four, two students writing portfolios. So each language arts teacher in the building. And one, language, one writing portfolio is what they consider a proficient exemplar portfolio, and the other one is a portfolio that they have concerns about. So that takes 45 minutes to an hour per person. Probably going, and I, I document each of the pieces I look for. What is the quantity in that, and what is the variety in that? Uh, I, I put together a uh, summary of all the things that I see and present that back to the literature, to, to the language arts teachers as a group. That is a, a flaw. That is a really intensive amount of time that could really be done by a language arts lead teacher. Would I want to say that I would take a, a district-wide person uh, and say that th this is the task that I'm going to have you do? Personally, I'd rather see somebody who's working in the building with teachers who, who is a, I, I don't have any special training to do that. I'm just gathering information, returning it to people. I can have somebody else do that job, but I don't have anybody else. Would I want to tie up a district person who was doing, who was planning uh, summer classes that we could uh, conduct that is connecting people to uh, teachers college maybe for, for the writers project? I think there are greater opportunities than that. And I want to take that person who's at the district level who has more expertise than the person I have in my building. My person really good expertise in what teaching adolescent readers looks like, but may not have the background expertise that somebody might need to, to say, how do, you, how do you get kids to, to develop their academic awareness? Um, so I want to take that person at the district level and use that to build from within. I'm not interested really as much in sending people out to all these different functions to, to attend these different workshops and, and uh, other avenues outside of people is to bring things back and then try to schedule the sharing and figure that out. I'd like to have somebody on staff in Cape Elizabeth who's going to build these top-notch opportunities for consistent learning that fits into the K-12 sector. That's what I see that person focusing on. And I see the person that I have in, in our school as being focused on some different aspects of the job. That's just my take on it. Um, I'm going to shift back to Meredith. I have to tell you, it, it does sound like an overlap to mm -hmm. me, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody is capable of doing K-12 literacy curriculum, they're capable of doing it for the middle school. Otherwise, they're not really a K-12 person. But I, I guess I would accept yours and Steve's comment that there is a hole to fill there. But I would state for the record that I, I assume that hole will get built up at fairly soon, and we may not need a half-time literacy teacher in middle school. The luxury of having somebody on staff in the building when we're having the K through 12 person. I, so, I, I would think that is a reasonable conclusion. So I'm willing to. That's what I'm saying. I'm willing to compromise, but. I, I don't see this as, I see this overlap shouldn't mm -hmm. continue for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Can I just offer just a tiny bit of Oh, thoughts? you can always offer a tiny bit of thoughts, but I want to handle you. It seems to me that to the, ex to the extent that the K-12 literacy person is primarily going to be working with teachers, building up their skills and their capacity to be more effective teachers in the classroom for all kids, uh, to the extent that Steve's half-time literacy person is working directly with kids, uh, which with Angela was essentially half of her job. Um, that's, <coughs> that's not a need that the K-12 literacy coordinator is going to be able to meet, working with kids directly. Um, and that's a really critical time from what I've learned from Ken and Claire in terms of going from that shift in fifth and sixth grade where you're going from learning to read to reading to learn, which begins in late elementary school and continues through or continues through early elementary school. So the comparison really is, to some extent at least, to the extent that this position is a position that's working directly with kids, then it's more comparable to looking at Tom's um, literacy.
hours and support teachers that he has in the elementary school, and then looking at a diminishing, uh, diminishing level of services to a half-time position in the middle school, and then at this point, um, begin to our us doing it in a different way for the next mm -hmm. few years. Uh, so I'm not sure that the, there isn't anything in the elementary school, and then all of a sudden there is in the middle school and not in the high school to the extent that positions are involved. In I'm mindful of the time, and I think if we need more clarity on this, if, if well, actually, I think I finally okay. got an answer that makes sense to me that there is a special need of direct hands on education in the middle school, and I can see that by the nature of middle school. And it's a good description of what the K through 12 person is, which isn't necessarily fulfilling that role. And there might be a need, there is a need for having both for at least for the foreseeable future. So I think that explanation when combined with the other two, actually works for me. So, I don't need any more time. Good news. Thank Yay. you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, I'm a slow learner, but I don't give up. Jeff, can you answer all, all right. David's questions from now on? <laughs> uh, Jeff, if you'll go ahead and continue your momentum on that, and then after Jeff's presentation, I know uh, some people who uh, joined us may have questions, so right after Jeff's presentation, any questions with him will open up uh, questions to uh, anyone who, would, who attended the workshop. So I'll try to be quick. Um, I'm going to start where, where the veteran board members have heard me many times over the years talk about um, the mission of the high school, as I see it anyway. I think the community wants us to be a small, comprehensive, rigorous high school. And I think all, of, all three of those things are really critical in sort of thinking through the budget. That's sort of always my favorite record. Small, we are comprehensive and rigorous. Uh, so, the a couple of illustrations about that. And, um, for example, you know, we want to meet the needs of all kids, and as kids go through the system, the, the needs get wider. Um, so, for example, in math, we have courses from MLR Math, which is short for Mean Learning Results Math, which is a support class for our most struggling math students all the way up to AP Calculus. Um, in foreign language, we have classes from <coughs> French and Spanish 1R, which is essentially a review for our most struggling foreign language students, all the way up to Spanish and French 6, um, which is a nice feature in Cape Elizabeth, which is made possible by the school board's support of the foreign language program beginning in grade 3. Um, Steve stole some of my thunder. Um, <laughs> um, so I appreciate that, because uh, I've typically been the one giving the examples of, okay, and I'll just repeat it, because it happens, I think, even more in the high school than probably the middle school, because of the variety of course levels that we have. But, you know, you have 28 students who sign up to take a class. You offer one or two sessions. Uh, so it's one of 28 or two of 14. You have 53 students who sign up for a class. Is it two of 24, 27, or is it three of 17? And those decisions repeat themselves again and again and again. So although we shoot for class sizes of around 20, and our, our teachers are more than skilled and competent to deal with class sizes of 20, we can be a little bit more, um, it's, the decisions are not always that clean and neat. So in being, and that that's, comes back to that small part of uh, what the high school is, small comprehensive part of what the high school is. <coughs> So that's my big framework um, for um, so always thinking about the budget. And then I'll just talk about our staffing. The staffing proposal is to um, reduce the literacy position, which is not something I went into this budget cycle thinking I was going to do, but Angela's decision sort of put that possibility on the table. Um, and I will tell you specifically why the trade-off is worth it to me. And that is, and I've talked to Meredith about this, although somebody gave me an excellent idea, I might lobby Meredith to have this person actually physically located in the high school. Um, I think you just got the idea of that. You got the idea what? five minutes ago. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, but I might go for that. <laughs> um, but the other possibility is, is I do think one of the things that's true with like the standardized exams, particularly at the high school level, the PSAT, SAT, I think they're just great assessments. And even the NWEAs that we've given and that sort of thing, they're not really very diagnostically helpful.
helpful to figure out what you do with Johnny or Sue. You get big, broad categories of how does the student do with informational text compared to literary, literary text. That's hard for a teacher who doesn't have a training in literacy to figure out, okay, because understanding informational text, there are so many sub-skills that go into understanding literary, you know, informational and literary text. So one of the things I'm excited about is the possibility of getting a K-12 person who, similar to Tammy and Claire's work in the, in the elementary school, has really been able to really think carefully about what should be the menu of assessments and what can we learn from assessments so that teachers can figure out how to adjust instruction. Um, Angela has been absolutely fantastic, and I would love to have her continue in the role, but this person, I think, in my mind, the thing that I'm going to be pushing for hard is somebody who is really knowledgeable about assessments and literacy and helping teachers translate really big, broad informational things and getting really specific about what do the kids in front of them in their classes need. So that's a literacy position. Um, I have a one-fifth English teacher reduction as well. Um, based on class sizes, that's, that's, that's a position which is right now, it's a one-fifth position. It's not a bit of a full-time position, it's a one-fifth position. And just given class enrollment, um, trends over the years, I think that's something that I can, I can do. Um, I've also suggested a, um, a, a new experiment in choral music, because choral music in the high school has been dwindling. Um, and that really concerns me a lot, and we've tried a lot of different things. So one of the things I've put on the table is the possibility, of, if, depending on how our choral music sign-ups go this year, is the possibility of looking at an extracurricular program or perhaps a couple of extracurricular programs. Um, it's not that we are not going to offer the same classes that we do right now, but if the course enrollments in choral music continue with the trend that I see, I don't think I can continue with it at the sizes we've had for the last couple of years. Um, and we have a really, I think, incredibly talented, fascinating um, choral music teacher who might be really actually well suited to do, to, to especially in an out-of-school situation, to maybe attract some of those kids. Because unfortunately what happens too often in choral music, when kids get to high school, particularly a small, comprehensive, rigorous high school, they have to make choices. And too often choral music is, is a decision that kids make to drop, which is too bad. Uh, I've also suggested a reduction in, uh, of, zero, of a one-tenth position in drama. Again, this will not be reflected in any change in offerings in the program of studies. And we'll be looking at the course enrollments, and if we need to adjust that, then Meredith and I will certainly talk about that. Um, so the offerings will be the same, but there's been a bit of a drop over the last couple of years. So I'm anticipating that if that continues, that we'll be able to afford some of the section of uh, theater. But we'll take a look at the numbers. So that's really the positions. And then in terms of non-salary, it looks like I have about a $25,000 increase in the non-salary items. Of that roughly $25,000 increase, um, $11,000 close, to, I think that's probably about 40% or so, is due to an increase in PADS, which is reflective of enrollment of our PADS students two years ago. Um, and we don't have any control over it, so there's an $11,000 uncontrollable increase in the PADS uh, expense program. There's a $5,000 increase in the Achievement Center under the software line. That is not, that does not represent an increase in services. It represents an increase in cost for the same services um, that Plato is charging us. Ginger and I have, Ginger Raskiller, who is the Achievement Center Coordinator, and I have talked about, are there replacements yet for Plato on the horizon? Uh, particularly free and web-based things, and she was mentioning that increasingly there are materials that are out there, and Ginger has talked to some of the suppliers <coughs> of these materials. Um, her take on it, and she's pretty convincing, she knows her story, she researches things pretty carefully, but that's probably about a year away from us being able to make that point. So I've put in the increase at this point, um, and we're also, but we are going to try to do, see if we can negotiate something a little bit smaller with Plato, because we've been pretty loyal customers for a lot of years, so we're working on that. Um, and then there is an increase in supplies. Uh, I can share the details of that with you if you'd like. And then there's also an increase of a few thousand dollars in the extracurricular account, which is mostly dues and fees. 
can spread over a number of different things. The biggest increase that I proposed is for the World Affairs Council um, to try to begin to pay a slightly higher share of the expenses, not travel expenses, but the conference expenses, you know, just registering for these conferences and doing that sort of thing. Uh, there are some other places as well. There's a, a small increase proposed for speech because of the increasing size of the speech team. There's an increase proposed for robotics because of the increasing interest in that. Um, um, so that is my budget. Thank you. Yes. Um, I do have one question, and I'm sorry if I missed this in your explanation, but you um, propose eliminating a current point two FTE English teaching position? Yep, that's that's the English. Right now I have, um, the English department has, I think, 7.2 teachers. It's possible it's 8.2 teachers, but it's, it's a whole number and then a point two. There's one person who teaches one class. He's, <laughs> he's taught one class for quite a few years. Um, he's indicated to me that this is his last year. Um, I haven't got a letter of resignation yet, but he's told me that, that and, and quite frankly, even given the, over the last few years, the decline in student enrollment and looking at what we can offer next year, I'm quite confident that we'll be able to um, serve the student's needs, um, even if we reduce that one position, that point to two position. So it's essentially the equivalent of one class taught by one teacher for one year. Uh, Jeff, on page four, um, first bullet point, you have a fairly long laundry list of replacements of books. Oh, thank you. I meant to mention that. Oh, should I just shut up now? No, 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 because yeah. I enjoy yeah. finished, but I should have mentioned that. You can talk. Good we're wor we're working through that. I mean, one of the things we're exploring is the po of, is the possibility of looking at some digital textbooks that are compatible with the iPads. Um, Mike and Mike, right now, um, Apple Computer offers through its iStore, I think there are nine digital versions of texts. They're all math and science. The math will not work for us unless we want it as a, because they don't do Chicago math yet. And I don't want to use this budget in, in the high school to sort of view away from Chicago math, with which we've had a lot of success. The science our teachers have looked at, there's a possibility that we may be we may be doing that with the case of biology, but the biology teachers are looking really carefully at that. Um, so right now, that's the that's the pool. There are other digital textbooks that are out there, but and publishers are scrambling like mad to try to make them more compatible than they presently are with iPads. Um, in fact, we had a, uh, two sales representatives from McGraw Hill in a couple of weeks ago to meet with our science and social studies teachers about what they have. The, the dilemma is that they're not quite there in terms of real iPad compatibility because they've still got a few more materials than we'd like to see in Flash, which is not compatible with iPads right now. Um, my sense is that Flash is being squeezed out. Um, Adobe, which makes Flash, is sort of surrendered to Apple um, in, the in a sort of a battle that's been going on behind the scenes. So my sense is that this time next year we'll be in a much better position to be able to. So we are. So the. So I haven't really directly answered your question. Who knows? Um, uh, <laughs> we are working through uh, what it is. What what the priorities here are. Um, I think the top priorities are going to be the foreign language text. I forget which one that is. French. Uh, French because that's really, really old, um, and probably honors biology, and then we will see what others, given leftover funds, we will be able to pick off, and then we'll, be, we'll begin to see some of these same names come up next year. I put more on than I knew was realistic, because I was hoping that we'd be able to find some, some um, cost-effective ways to get iPad-compatible texts, and we still may, we haven't given up the hope on that yet, but um, I, I'm not highly encouraged right now. But just for, for example, down the road, right now, you, you can get those nine titles are available, and you can get them for $14.99, or is it, four, yeah, $14.99 per student per year. 
Now that translates into the t our typical text will average five to six years of use. Well, you can see here some go a little bit more. Um, <laughs> but, when you, but when you compare that to hard copy text or even most Cheaper. digital text, are now running, particularly science and math, are running easily high 90s or up to 150 bucks a shot. That's really competitive. Um, and I think down the road, it's going to not only lighten backpacks, but save money as well. But it's not quite there yet. I, I guess what I'm trying, I'm still, I still haven't quite answered my question, but I haven't quite I, I fully. I one earlier, come on. Uh, <laughs> no, you, you supplemented one earlier on. Um, it seems like we have a lot of, I mean, I have to tell you, eight years for U.S. history, eight-year-old yep. U.S. history thing is pretty damn, pretty darn old. Nine years in chemistry, uh, seven years in biology. You know, biology and U.S. history and chemistry change. Gee. Um, it looks like we have a much greater need than a $33,554 budget encompasses. Is that correct? We do. So would it make sense to increase the budget this year to with the idea that we'll may find text. And with, I, I'm a believer in increasing your budget for periodicals, not the instant you need it, but maybe generating that, increasing that money over time because it's less of a pain on the taxpayer. So if we really need to replace all these things, and we're only replacing three, maybe, for 33000 why don't we put 40000 or 45000 in there so we can start building a budget to replace within two years what we really need to do. Why are you laughing at me? I, I'm smiling because, I, I, because I'm going to say that if the board decides that it wants to allocate more money to the budget, then the district leadership team should have a conversation about where those funds should be best allocated. And while that may be the number one priority at the high school, that may not be the number one priority for the district. Okay, so if I offer to give some money for one purpose, it's going to get torn up and maybe used for some other purpose, so I don't offer it for this one purpose. That seems I don't, illogical. Does that, does that matter, but I didn't hear you say that. I, I, I did. <laughs> that's, that's not David, my I, I representation. I think the point is that may be, you know, a priority that you value highly, but it may not no, be. It's not necessarily what I value. I've been told in this thing that, that we have a need, and we can only fund part of that need. We have a need right now. And so my question is, and, and it looks like technology and supply is changing, why aren't we, why isn't it possible to fund now on the anticipation we may get it within next year, all of a sudden these books are ready and we can use them, or the year after? Why do we fund, why not fund something that we need now over time rather than relying on a $300,000 uh, uh, out of school text we can uh, supplement? Because we waited too long. Um, this may help to answer that question a little bit. Sort of the, the the judgment is based on the conversations with the, the two biggest textbook publishers in the United States are McGraw-Hill and Pearson. They control like 90% of the, the high school academic textbook community. And that's what they so, I mean, they go under different names. They have about 17 houses each that they've... So what, in talking with representatives from both the companies, what the impression that I'm getting is that to the extent textbooks are made available for iPad, um, it's not that there's going to be a huge explosion of text over the, gradually over the next several months so that if I put more money in the budget or the district put more money in the budget, I could somehow spend it this year. So the gamble, I, I you know, the, the judgment that I was going to, is, is in terms of the high school, in terms of why I did what I did, is to here are the needs, let's prioritize the ones, and then I think we'll be in a position the following year to be able to put in, you know, maybe a little bit more, maybe even a little bit less, and get a whole lot more textbook. The CPUS history textbooks are, uh, they're old, um, they're serviceable. Um, chemistry I'd be more concerned about, um, but if we need to, that would, be, that would be my next priority. Uh, and that's why I'm looking, hoping that the either chemistry or biology on the iPad versions that are available. But if the board were to put more money, or, or certainly the DLT would be glad to talk about it, if the board wants to put more money in, is putting more money in, I still think there's, it makes some sense to wait and to see so that we can get a whole lot more textbook for the money when we do the increase. But I know that 
based on what I've heard from both Representatives McGraw-Hill and Pearson, there's not going to be a whole bunch of textbooks that come out over the summertime that are available for us next year. They're still going to be a year out before they're going to be the next academic year, which means the next budget year. Paper. So you believe that the 33,000 will replace? Uh, first of all, I think it is the function of the board to decide if we want to spend more money on textbooks. That is a prerogative. And we can choose to do that. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, it's a concern we've had for years in this district. We had to go outside and raise $300,000, of which I was part of, because we, we couldn't get it done within this system. Part of it is it's a large chunk of money at one point in time. It's a lot easier to raise it by ten grand or twenty grand a year than it is $300,000 in one year. I'm trying to avoid another tax we can. So that's why I'm asking these questions. I absolutely appreciate your point, and my only point is that there are lots of priorities within the budget. And before we were, before Jeff were to give you an answer to, would we just add money there? I think it would be if the board decides it wants to add, allocate additional resources. I think we could say, and here are some places we would encourage you to consider allocating those additional resources. But certainly, it is the board's decision about where to put them. I think any more, uh, if we need any more, uh, we can have this as a line item if there, we need more follow-up information. Can we say, I'm, I'm curious, because I'd like to talk to Jeff afterwards. Can we add this as a, make a note that for our last meeting, if we have time? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about textbooks. Mm -hmm. you, you can fund a lot of things, but textbooks is probably one of the primary, textbooks and teachers is what you need in a building. Sorry. <coughs> and that's a pretty important item. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Shedd? No. Uh, th these were the items we were planning to uh, to cover, and obviously, like I said at the beginning of the meeting, we would uh, make uh, time available for anyone who attended that had anyone uh, wanted to had questions or comments or any ideas that they wanted to share. Um, so, if you do, if you Choose to if you would just uh, introduce yourself and uh, um, try to limit it to two or three minutes, and that way we could uh, you know, hopefully address your questions. And if not, we can uh, follow up uh, through phone call or email. So, please. Is there a mic somewhere? Yeah, I thought it was a mic. There's a mic, Jana. I stood there. I thought it was short enough. And we can hear you, so if it doesn't work. Um, Jeff, I'm Janet Dermott. I'm, um, Jeff, I was wondering, I was sent here with a mission. Can I go home and tell my chorus daughter that there's definitely going to be chorus no matter how it's orchestrated? <laughs> Pardon? Okay. And encourage her friends to sign up to take the class to take <laughs> chorus as well. That's can you orchestrate a chorus? The marketing <laughs> campaign. <laughs> Does anyone else have any, uh, want to step up to the mic? Please. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Deb Patry. I, can you hear me okay? I'm a um, parent of a son in second grade with high-functioning autism. And um, I just wanted to ask a question um, of Jane, because you spoke earlier about how you had success in Yarmouth with academic achievement in children when, once you made the shift in philosophy. Can you speak at all to whether or not you made any um, progress in the social skills of these children? Um, because children with high-functioning autism have social cognitive deficits, and they can learn, they are bright, they can test, um, but if you cannot apply that in the real world, you can't get anywhere. Um, you can't form relationships, you can't um, hold a job. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to the social aspects of that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, We 
didn't separate them out and just say that educators were only focusing on academics and putting aside the, the social emotional. We had a, um, an equal number of young people in Yarmouth, as we do here, to of um, young people on the autism spectrum. And so the social emotional was attended to as much as the academic. And so the progress was slow, steady, um, and not neglected, nor will it be next year. So we, we didn't separate them out and give up one for the other. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Jennifer Brooking, and I have three children who attend Pond Cove. Is it on? <laughs> Thank you. Um, two of my children receive instructional support. I have a couple of questions. Um, I would imagine that there would be some training for the mainstream teachers on how to help these children who are going to be put more into the classroom without support. And I was wondering if you could just talk quickly about what that training would look like. Who would do the training and when would that happen? I can share um, an email I received, or the substance of an email that I received last week from a teacher because the, those trainings already happen. Um, last week, um, Pam Bose, who's a social worker at the high school, and Sonia Croft um, led a training together on um, understanding the characteristics of students with autism spectrum disorder <coughs> and how to, uh, what those students might look like in a classroom setting with respect to some of the behaviors that you might see, some of the strategies that might be effective, using visual supports, those, those kinds of pieces. Um, and I received an email from a teacher who attended, or, classroom teacher who attended that training um, the next day, in fact, that said, wow, this was terrific. Um, I, I'm so glad to have had this opportunity, and I feel like I'm, I'm much better prepared to support these children now. Um, so I think we're already doing that work. Um, I, I'm um, doing a book group with 18 teachers from across the district. Uh, which looks at um, similar pieces. We're reading um, a Carol Tomlinson book about differentiated practice and differentiated instruction and how to look at um, meeting the needs of students in a classroom setting. But certainly, um, we'll, we'll be continuing to do that work. And Jane can certainly add to that, I'm sure. Well, Jen, one of the things you said was that children would be put back without service, and nobody's being they put anywhere without that. service. So. Well, that's at least what I heard. So it's important to know that children who need service will continue to get service. It may not be by the same adult that they have this year. Um, the other part is that that kind of professional learning, we're doing our best to embed that and have that happen every day all the time. Um, the opportunity to have more teachers working with classroom teachers offers us an opportunity to do more of that. Uh, the Pond Cove student support team, which is 23 people strong, that means that all of the helping professionals in that school meet on a weekly basis, and we dedicate a reasonable amount of that time to um, professional learning as well. So we're doing some things now. We're certainly excited to be able to do more next year and look forward to it and um, welcome any ideas that you all have. We just had one more. Could you just briefly explain um, how the number of 12 and a half cuts came to be? I know that you met with certain staff. Could you just briefly explain that, um, what, how that went about? We looked at the numbers of ed techs versus the numbers of professionals, looked at the needs for more professionals, and three educational technician positions equal enough funding for a teacher. So that's how we got to that. Okay, and decision. you said that um, it was also based on the needs of the individual children. Mm -hmm. What um, did you get that by looking at current IEPs? Mm -hmm. um, how many IEPs are left for the year? Do you oh. know? 
I don't. You I'm don't sorry. have that number? I, just <laughs> I don't have that number in mind. Because I know we haven't had our IEP yet, and I'm just concerned that that staff won't be there because you haven't looked at what my children's needs are, especially not without m me being there, because that's a team decision as to what kind of support is needed. And if you're just taking away 12.5, I don't know if that was, if you had paid attention to that. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, mean, I do. I'm happy to Have you allocated you for? Personally, about your children. Okay. I'm going to speak globally no, to how I understand that. we looked. So we looked globally at the services that we have now for the children this year, taking into consideration all the children that we know, not our incoming kindergartners, and looked at what we have for services and what the children need. So we didn't... Um, parse out anyone whose IEP hasn't been held yet. Okay. We understand, and I think we said earlier, that it is early in the year, and, and this conversation started earlier than now, started in January. So um, that's a really early time to start thinking about next September. But that's just the way the world is in budget land. And so we know that as we move along, things may change a little bit. And we continue to say that, and as we say it, we do mean that. So if the needs change and the staffing requirements change, we're going to have to make adjustments. Okay. I think in part two, what I heard embedded in that question is that, that you know, that there's an assumption that all of the 31 educational technician positions that exist are one-on-one -on -one support people, and that isn't the case. Um, so, you know, certainly we understand that there will continue to be a need for one-on-one -on -one support and shared support positions. Um, and, and again, I you know, believe I just feel a decision has been made without um, our family having our IEP meeting, um, and that's worrisome. Well, for that me would that be there illegal. Won't be staff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I, I, exactly. Know, I, I, I right. don't think that's okay. that's what this is predicated on. You know, this is by no means an interest in reducing services and creating a more regressive model of special education. Right. And I know that's not what you're right. suggesting. It, it, you know, from from my standpoint, and certainly it's Jane's job. Um, but but individual education plans are created by a team, and they're created every year by a team. But as as Jane and the team of teachers and staff within the buildings have looked at existing needs. They feel comfortable that this reduction is uh, in ed techs as offset by four teacher positions is going to be adequate to meet the identified needs as well as continue to provide the individual needs that are identified in IEPs. So if 12 and a half are cut and you continue to have IEP meetings and you're realizing that you do need more, you'll Absolutely, because that that's the way the if law that's works. That's the way the IEP, okay. Thank you. Yep. I think that's a great question. It's uh, because it's reality based and it's, I think it never hurts to go over it again and again and again that all children will be served as they state in the IEP. Um, and that's why I can look at this and say, oh, I can understand it because we're never going to go against the IEP process. Right. We can't. We can't. Well, I have, a oh, I'm sorry. I have a question of, of her answer. Um, I'm not sure I understand the answer. How are we going to add people if we have a fixed budget? I, I, well, I think if the need changes so that we have more um, educational technician needs as the services are identified in individual IEPs, then you know we would probably be saying, okay, then we're going to go with more ed techs and fewer teachers because that's what the individual IEPs dictate. Well, that's what I was trying to get you to, to, to flesh out, that there is flexibility in shifting. There is enough, I don't want to say fluff, but there's enough um, elasticity in what we're keeping that we can adjust it to as yet undefined needs. Is that correct? That is correct, and I think that's the nature of instructional support okay. in general. The services go where the needs are. Thank you. Um, to different comments about your instructional support. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking about all the children that I'm, are family friends that have instructional support needs. And I'm thinking of all 
the other children in a classroom, and I'm old enough to have been around a long time and seen education kind of evolve around this concept and basically recycle a lot of um, what you did in Yarmouth. I've seen it before. What I'm wondering is how it's going to impact the classroom, and if you're going to come up with if there's research that goes against having a teacher conundrum rather than a paraprofessional conundrum, um, because teachers being in a classroom and maybe doing training, but that is not equivalent to a degree person. Like I'm talking about the teachers. The training you're doing with them, I'm having a hard time imagining the average teacher being able to manage kids with instructional support needs. I'm wondering how that's going to, without their one-to-ones that we've been used to, we're all used to that. Um, whether you're the parent of a instructional support needs kid, or you're the parent of a child without that need, we're all used to it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering how it's going to impact the classroom, the children, and the teachers. Young people, I, I'll say, I guess I'll say it again, young people who need an adult to be with them in the classroom will have an adult there. If the adult is a teacher, certified teacher versus an ed tech, I'm not sure that makes a difference. The child will continue to receive the support. The positives of having a teacher and a teacher in a classroom are more than having a teacher with an ed tech. Um, the, the direct service that certified teachers can provide to children is different than what ed techs are providing. And I'm not really sure how to quantify that. Okay. I can totally understand that. So you're saying that there's going to be a degree teacher to that that works with the kids in the So it isn't a one-to-one -one <coughs> correspondence. So, 31 ed techs that continue that right now are employed in this district are not all one-to-one -one ed techs. Some children need an adult, an extra adult, for a portion of the day. Some children need an adult for two or three. Some there may be an opportunity for two or three children to be in a classroom. So, it's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation and. Without my taking out, and um, which would be totally inappropriate, but without my taking out all of the children and all of the needs and laying it out, the math will never work um, because it's a piece of an adult here and a piece of an adult there working with different groups of children in different settings. So, again, children who have the directed need identified in their IEP will receive that service. And so you've not seen any adverse effect on the teachers or the, the students in these classrooms yet? I haven't, no. One comment I would make, you know, I think uh, when I reviewed this, the, you know, uh, uh, implicit assumption was it's all one-to-one. -one. And I think if you think, you know, right now we're currently serving 180 students in special education, um, where if you just look at dedicated instructional support, there's not 180 uh, lab technicians um, in, 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 in teachers. So I think, um, you know, that's, you know, so, you know, because that's when a lot of the emails said, you know, we have one-to-one, -one, and I know every situation's different, and the message we've received is if a child needs one, to one support, then you know it's a case by case um, situation, and and that service will, will be provided. Michael, may I ask a question? What? Sure. Um, I believe part of Jana's question, if I'm hearing you correctly, Jana, is uh, regards to classroom management in general and behavioral issues, even for kids who don't require a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, the numbers now have 
it's seemingly so, even though it's not one-on-one, -on -one, of course it's not that, but there's, there's um, ed techs in more classrooms, and there'll be fewer instructional support team members in classrooms for less time. But I'm hearing you are saying that with the um, uh, elevated skills of the instruct instructional support team members who are then able to give targeted <coughs> interventions to <coughs> those children who need additional instructional support will help modify their behavior, perhaps, and then help um, relieve that teacher of needing to give that student more attention in an integrated classroom setting so that classroom management issues would then actually become fewer. Is that a correct assumption? That's a good assumption, and I would say to you that I don't think we have at least from my experience and observation, we don't have a significant number of classroom management issues in this district with young people. Um, we have some amazing young people, so, um, and teachers seem to be doing really well with that. Does that help you, Jenna? Yes, and always with more Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. Sounds like people are going on. Hi, I'm Anthony King. Uh, I have a son at Pond Cove uh, who's in IS, and uh, that's kind of a moot point. I want to uh, think about the global picture that, that you guys are trying to think about. And I see uh, you intimated that there's going to be a huge uh, problem with the shift. Uh, maybe, maybe it's brief, maybe it's going to be more than brief. Um, kids are going to have a hard time having 13 faces disappear and four ones appear um, that are being serviced. Um, it's going to be like a tsunami. Like uh, September is going to be fine, and probably October going on and on. And, and I'm wondering how you're going to be able to deal with that and what your strategy is. Um, I know a couple years ago, my son had two teachers leave, uh, retired, and got swapped in. It took him three months to recover. Just from that, if one tenth of the kids are like that in instructional support, you're going to be um, overloaded. Um, that those first that in the fall, going into the winter, um, I would think you'd need a really to strategize to prevent um, just being inundated um, and having all those having all your teachers having to come into classrooms all the time because there's fires to be put out constantly um, and. I was hoping, which doesn't sound like it's going to happen, looks like a decision's been made, but uh, it seems a preventative measure would be to wean instead of just pulling the Band-Aid and uh, maybe not have 12 and a half positions get cut right away, but to keep some of them and then, you know, after the year's over to let them go. But it sounds like you have a plan. It sounds... I, I, I can see, like, 50% of my brain says, yes, you should have more trained uh, staff come in. Um, you should have professionals who are trained uh, to help um, help out my child and all the children. Um, I see short-term issues, and I'm wondering what your plan is uh, to deal with those. Thank you. I guess either of us could start. I would say... Um, Again, having um, worked in education for a long time to include um, time that I worked as a special educator, those transitions happen every year, whether it's a new classroom teacher, sometimes it's a new special educator, sometimes it's a new school, sometimes it's a new related service provider. And um, the peak time that you're describing, you know, those several months, and again, that window varies with, with individual children, but that is not uncommon. Um, I would say um, special educators and related service providers um, have a fair amount of experience in dealing with that. And, and again, that's not an attempt to minimize that. Um, I also think that a lot of what special education does is really thinking about transition um, and preparing students for transition. Um, you know, as Jane said, I think there'd be a hope to try to identify before the end of the school year where people are going to be and where supports will be provided. But, uh, you know, sometimes we make those plans and things change. 
um, you know, we, we introduce a child to their, you know, who's leaving third grade to the teacher that they're going to have in fourth grade, and then that child, uh, that teacher, for some reason, decides to move on and isn't there when the child comes back in the fall. Um, I, I think that we try to be very thoughtful um, on an individual basis about how to best make those connections, how to ease those transitions, how to um, minimize that for each individual child, and each individual child needs different things in a transition process. Um, <coughs> but it's something that we're used to. And, and again, yes, there are going to be several more transitions as a result of this piece, and I don't, I don't um, take that lightly. Um, but I think that's already part of the planning process that people in special education do. Hi, I'm Michelle Kane. I have three boys at Pond Cove. I apologize, I know it's late. Um, but um, I want my two to three minutes. Um, it's upsetting as a parent that, you know, I, I didn't get to, to uh, provide any input during the drafting of the proposal, during that whole process. started in November. We found out about it, you know, in January. Um, and this is the first opportunity we've had to speak, you know, about it. So that's a little upsetting. Um, but I just wanted to um, address some concerns. Um, it, it kind of was a recurring theme that we might be stuck on paraprofessional support in the classroom um, or stuck on the system that we've had. Um, but speaking for my husband and I, we are especially having a child um, that has a brain disorder. Um, we welcome change, we, you know, revel in it, you know, our child has learned so much, um, we don't, we don't claim to be experts by any means, so if Jane has a program that's been working, um, you know, we're more than happy to try it. I guess the big issue that we're trying to overcome is how 37 professionals are going to manage 180 IS students. I know they all don't have one on ones because that's not possible, but many of them do. Um, many of these kids have high functioning autism. Um, from just my experience of observations in the classroom, you know, as volunteering and coming into the school, and I'm just speaking for Pond Cove, I don't um, know about the other schools. But I just, the numbers, we're trying to figure out the numbers, and, you know, is there a way? Instead of doing such a drastic change, and instead of you know doing a um, stop the bleeding thing at the beginning, um, is there a way to change the proposal at this stage, or is it too late? Is there a way to cut it in half and say, let's try to hire two special education teachers right now and reduce six and a half ed techs and see how that works? Um, it's just scary to think of losing all these trained people and then realizing in a year that we need them back and then they're not available and then it takes a year to get the new people trained and then our kids have lost a year or two of their education. You know, so um, I know that wasn't very um, eloquent, but I also sent an email <laughs> um, listing a bunch of our concerns and I, I do hope to have those addressed. I, I know they won't be addressed tonight, but I did want to um, kind of explain to, I don't know if there was a general, uh, uh, just try and um, explain our position um, and what our concerns are. And we just hope that whatever happened during that drafting process of the proposal, that most of the 180 IEPs were looked at. I don't know how many were looked at, but numbers count, and all these kids' needs have to be met. And um, I, I love the blanket assurances that it will be, and we really appreciate the school system here, and we're so happy with it. Um, but our concern is just the numbers. So, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, no. there was one word, um, <laughs> almost there. Um, when, Jane, when you were talking about um, kids that won't need one-on-ones anymore and that kids with multiple disabilities will have ed techs, that scared me. Like, how many disabilities do you have to have to have an ed tech? That's, so if you could just define multiple disabilities for me then, then I'll so sit down. <laughs> multiple disabilities. When we think of young people who are nonverbal, are on the autism spectrum, or have um, mental retardation, um, 
significant emotional disabilities, learning disabilities. It, it's really, it's, it's, it's language to describe the children who have the most need. So when I say multiple disabilities or I say significant needs, I'm talking about young people who have disabilities that are significantly impacting their ability to benefit from their education anywhere in the school and need that kind of individualized service that, that we're talking about. So, so one disability could be sufficient to meet that need? Is that what you're saying? A young person that has severe autism would be a young person who would have a need for additional service that we're talking about. But a young so that's my language. High functioning so autism? I'm not saying mm -hmm. that. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get. IEP so. teams make decisions I know, about but. who needs okay. what. So, <laughs> you know, we could talk about young people with learning disabilities. There are some that probably need additional intervention from adults, for mm -hmm. example. But in this arena, we're not going to get to the specifics of it. Um, so not I don't want to talk about specific children. But yeah, no. I'm not yeah, I think the answer. I think the answer is it's not about what the disability category is per se. It's about okay. what does this child need to benefit from their instruction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Does anyone have any uh, follow up? Any more questions? Anyone uh, at the table have any questions or follow up? If not, we'll go over the the next steps. Um, you know, first I'd like to say, uh, besides the, the textbook follow up issue, um, unless it sounds like uh, you know the areas we discovered. Hopefully, the board has uh, in sufficient information to make a decision on those areas. Obviously, if you need more follow up, you can contact. Um, <coughs> uh, Meredith or myself, um, if you want to talk to so on the DLT, Meredith can point you in the right direction. Um, our next meeting will be uh, March, or our next budget workshop meeting will be March 20th. We'll cover uh, capital improvements, facilities maintenance, transportation, staff and student, uh, student support, technology, athletics, uh, community services slash pool. So if you have uh, questions that weren't addressed in the packet, if you could send those to me and we'll use the same format uh, that we used uh, for this meeting. Uh, there will also be an opportunity for the uh, public to, to ask questions similar to this meeting uh, at the end of uh, at the end of those uh, discussion areas. So uh, for those who came out, thank you. Hopefully we were able to address some of your questions. If you have, uh, you know, want to follow up, you can follow up with the uh, superintendent or uh, the director of instructional support. And uh, we're, we appreciate your patience and definitely appreciate you communicating with us to help us understand, uh, you know, your perspective of the situation. And we'll, we'll take all those into consideration as we re review and uh, make a decision on, on the budget. So thank you uh, for your time. and. David, I, it, if I, I have a little schedule here, and it done like today, you changed it slightly. Are we going to have a? Do we have a? Are you shaking head? I haven't asked my question yet. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, this what subject is. matter is going to be covered at each particular session? Changed a little bit for this one. Um, is, is there been an email to us about what you, you said it so quickly I could not. Oh yeah, it's in your that. packet. The, I, I tonight don't, we were scheduled. Yeah, it's on uh, page Part five. I'm sorry, we had a... The slides from last week. And the only thing we added to the 27th was uh, okay. funding and revenue sources um, and some of the issues you had brought up about uh, mm -hmm. I was looking at the long, wrong timeline. I found it sure, now. No. Too many timelines for me. That's right. Okay. I thought you were just disgusted with me. So uh, <laughs> thank you and good night.